This program is designed and presented by the University of Toronto at, at Scarborough Bio on the Go student program. This event is aimed at older adults who want to learn more about the COVID-19 virus, the vaccine available, and how to discern fake news from real information. Uh, they will cover topics such as why the vaccine is so important and why false information about it can be dangerous, as well as why everyone who is able to get the vaccine should. Um, so without further ado, I'd like the team to start the workshop. Thank you, Shaheen. That was a wonderful introduction. So again, hi, welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, we are from the University of Toronto. We are a group of students. And again, my name is Busha. Um, and we're just gonna jump right in and get started. So hopefully if I can get all of this to work. <laughs> okay, great. So what we're gonna cover today, we've got three main topics for you guys. First, we're gonna start off with fake news. What is it? How do you stay away from it? And some strategies that you guys can use to um, figure out for yourselves if, if something you're reading is reliable or not. Then we're gonna move on to probably what everyone is really here for, COVID. We're gonna talk a little bit more about the virus, gonna go a little bit more into detail about it than maybe you've heard on the news already. Um, and then we're also gonna talk about the vaccine and how it's made and why you should take it and all that good stuff. And then we're going to end off with a topic about herd immunity. You may have heard this term before. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. And if you haven't, that's totally okay because we're gonna learn about it. And we're also gonna talk about uh, some of the data behind herd immunity to help uh, hopefully help give you a really good idea as to why it's so important. So to start, we're gonna jump right into fake news and credibility. So fake news is uh, really an epidemic in itself. Ever since the pandemic has started, there's all these articles, all this information popping up, especially all over the internet, because it's so easy to post anything that you really want. Um, and it's really been this number one form of misinformation that's been going around. And so I really wanted to focus on um, how to discern if something is a credible source. So that is any material that is uh, reliable information and it's presented to you in a way that's meant to be objective as well as true, as true as it can possibly be. And what we want to stay away from is something called clickbait. So clickbait, it's kind of an internet term, but really it's just any content that's designed to grab your attention and make you click on it, open it, read it, spend your time with it. Um, but it's never true, it's never beneficial for you, the information involved. So like an example, this is an article, it's a fake article, it's a fake Fox News article, it looks very real, but it was going viral and it was being spread and, um, uh, shared between lots of people uh, with this title, while the world is waiting for a vaccine, one mom has found a solution to fight back against the coronavirus outbreak. This is prime example of clickbait. I really, you know, I know moms are great. I love my mom, but I don't think she'd ever be able to find the cure to a virus in the kitchen. It's really, it's not reliable. So hopefully, after today, everyone will be very mindful of the crap that they read. And hopefully I'll help break down this little acronym. And um, these are all things that you can keep in mind when you're reading articles and you're reading the news and different posts online. So we're just gonna jump right into breaking down each one of these. So currency, currency is concerned with how recently was this information posted or updated and the best way that you can tell if currency is involved in an article is if there's a date present or what that date is. So for example, if we're looking at this first uh, article here, so the title already, Glass Vial Shortage Could Delay Coronavirus Vaccine. It's really not true. This is a form of clickbait as well. But for example, if you were doing your own Googling uh, recently, you could see that the date here, although it is a little small, um, it's dated for July 2020. So right now, if you were looking at this, you would already know that this article and the information present is not relevant anymore. It's almost a year old. 
versus over here on the right, we're looking at an Ontario sourced article um, from the Ministry of Health in Ontario. And we can see that the date is very recent, just uh, two weekends ago, I believe, or maybe last weekend. Um, and they're talking about Ontario launching a provincial booking system for COVID-19 vaccines. So one, this article is definitely talking about something that you would like to know about and is actually very uh, relevant to you and it's dated very recently. So the next thing you wanna look at is relevance. So does the information relate to the actual topic that you're looking for? And how does this source compare to a different source that you've seen covering the same topic? So for example, again, one of our poorer uh, examples, Wolf Blitzer announces grim milestone as number of COVID deaths surpasses jelly beans in a jar. <laughs> this is a little bit of satire. If this is your kind of uh, comedy, I can link you to a wonderful website. But again, this information is really not relevant to probably what you would be looking for. It, it's a little funny, it's a little bit of comedy, but it's definitely not meant to be taken seriously. And then versus here, a global news uh, article and global news is a relatively good source for your information. Global news, CTV, CP24, these are all reliable places for you to get your news. And we can see here that their title, the Ontario reports uh, 1,553 new coronavirus cases and 15 more deaths. We can see that there's a, a name associated with the article, so we know who wrote it. And then we can see that, like we saw in currency, there is a posted date as well as an updated date, which is really important because there's it's completely possible that an article is posted and then better information is released later and so these articles are constantly being updated for you. And that's a really good key thing to note that the information that they're presenting you, they're trying their best to be objective and true. The next thing we have is the authority. So you wanna know who wrote the information. You want to know if they're knowledgeable on the topic. And the best way to do that is to see if a name is accredited to the article. So for this article in Medical News Today, it was written by uh, somebody who doesn't have the expertise, but it was reviewed by someone who has their pharmaceutical doctorate. So that already tells you that whoever wrote it reached out to get a real reliable source to look over their information. And so you know that you can probably really trust whatever information is here. Versus, again, this is another piece of satire news, Florida attempts to increase vaccinations by leaving loose syringes around beaches. No way is this reliable, no way would this be true. There is no name associated with it, so whoever wrote it was trying to remain anonymous for a reason. Um, so these kinds of articles should be avoided. They're catchy, they're kind of funny, but they're definitely not to be taken seriously. Next, we will be looking for accuracy. So where does the information come from? Is there evidence to support the information? And can you verify it with another source? This one's a little bit trickier to look out for because it does require you to do a little bit more searching. Um, but the reason I had this uh, article here is the title itself, again, is kind of clickbaity. It's, it's interesting. Dogs are the answers to all problems, including detecting COVID-19. Um, but the reason I included this is because within the article, within the last paragraph, I highlighted that they state it's important to note that this is still a test. So although the, they tried to pull you in with that very interesting title, um, they preface themselves and, and they give you a disclaimer that this is something in the works. It's not 100% true. They're still trying to figure it out. This is just some news for anybody who would be interested in topics like this. So things like this are really important to look out for while you're reading the articles themselves. It's not always just in the titles, although the titles do play a big role. There's always more components to an article and it's always good to look out for that and read. And the last thing we wanna look for is the purpose of the article. So why was it written? 
Is it to educate you? Maybe they're trying to sell you a certain product. There's a lot of endorsements these days in articles. What's the whole point? And what's the point of view from the article? So this example from Harvard Health Publishing with the Harvard Medical School, uh, already you can tell that the purpose, one, it's written by an MD. Um, you have a date as well as an updated date. Uh, and you know that from Harvard, they would really, their, their main priority would be to educate the public and anyone who has access to this information. So if you know that the purpose and the intent of the authors is, is positive, it's something you know to educate for you to gain more information, those are definitely better sources than just any link online. So another thing I would like to talk about, especially now that everything is online and all the information we get, we get it by searching, is domains and URLs. So what is that? So when you're typing into Google, let's say google.com, that's a domain, it's a URL. The entire thing is a URL, but google.com is the domain. So there are certain types of domains that we do want to avoid, that we know cannot be factual, cannot be backed up in any sense. So the first one is blog.website.com. Um, anything that starts with blog in its uh, URL, in its domain, immediately tells you that this is not a, a factual website. This is completely run by a single person or maybe a group of people and all the content in it is more than not an opinion. Um, it's anyone can make a blog. I can make a blog, you could make a blog. Uh, and it's, it's definitely always an opinion. The other one that's a little bit more tricky, but really important to look out for is this .com.co. So there is an abcnews.com, which is the news network that maybe many of you know. And there's also this fake version of it that looks very similar, but spreads misinformation and satire and anything else. And it ends with .com.co. So a lot of people who aren't aware of this difference get tricked up and they end up believing this abcnews.com.co as being the actual website. So that's something you definitely wanna look out for. And then the last thing is uh, this HTTP, which is part of the protocol that we can see here in the figure. So all this really means is when you look, uh, when you type in a website, you're oftentimes going to see HTTP or HTTPS. And the main difference here is that the S stands for security. And that is security for you as a user that you know that your information, your accounts and everything will be protected because this website provides you that security. When this S is not present, it's a little bit, it's really up to your discretion if you want to continue using that website. And again, tweets, viral text messages, Facebook posts, uh, WhatsApp messages, whatever it may be, those usually aren't the best source of any type of information and can often be biased and opinionated um, and definitely not fact in any way. So what do we want to look for? What are the good things that we want to look for? .edu is great. That stands for an educational institution like U of T, like Harvard, um, and their intent is always to educate. You can also have websites with .gov or uh, for us in Ontario and Canada, .ca are much more reliable. These are uh, usually government run uh, and government funded websites that are never out to spread misinformation. And then again, with the HTTPS, you want to see that S for the security. And that's how you know that you're good and you're protected. And then the last thing is .org or .int. So .org is for any nonprofit organization. And those are usually very trustful as well. And .int is, uh, stands for uh, international, I believe. And this is for international organizations like the World Health Organization that I'm sure we've all heard of a lot recently. So I have listed some sources here. Um, I believe we will be sending out a PDF copy of this entire presentation uh, after today. So hopefully uh, if you guys do want any of this information, I have linked it here. We have different links from the Ontario Ministry of Health. We have 
um, from the Public Health Agency of Canada and Ontario, as well as the CDC from the United States. I know many of us have family out there. Maybe you want to keep up with them, see how things are. Uh, World Health Organization, of course, they are a great source for uh, understanding COVID, as well as travel health notices in case that is relevant for anyone. So I just want to provide you all with some of those sources. So do we have any questions so far? I know we went through quite a bit, maybe a little bit fast. No? Okay. So it's time for a little game because we went through quite a bit of information. Um, and so we're going to be playing a Kahoot. Uh, and so if everyone has a device ready, I would love it if we could go to kahoot.it, not .com, it has to be .it. And you can enter, your screen will look something like this, the one that is on this uh, image of a phone, and you would enter the game pin 405449. So I'll leave that up here for a moment just so everyone can get in. So I should mention it would help if you have like a mobile device or a secondary device. Um, it's a lot easier than doing it on your computer. Um, Cause it runs best on like a phone or an iPad if you have one available. Push I'm just gonna share my screen so that they could see the game board. Yeah, go for it. Okay, so if you see your name up there, then you've done it right. <clears throat> and I think we should, while we're waiting, note if you do have any questions during the speaking portion, feel free to throw it in the chat and the team could probably get back to it towards the end or whenever there's a break for questions. Gates are something burning while they're talking and you don't want to forget. Oh, we lost somebody. We got them back. Awesome again. I think it's important to note too, even if uh, you can't quite figure out the tech and get on, the questions will all be popping up here. So you can mm -hmm. still kind of try to answer them on their own or even put them in the chat if you really want to so that you still get the experience. Because I recognize that sometimes it can be hard dealing with tech. That's why I like to joke. I went with the squishy tech, so brains instead of uh, <laughs> the hard tech like this. <laughs> yep, that's true. Uh, so I think we could kind of start with you having said that. Um, I can read the questions for you guys if you like. Yeah, sure. Okay. So right before we begin, if you've never played Kahoot, we're going to, on this screen, the purple screen that you see, the questions are going to appear uh, with corresponding answers based on different colors. On your screen, on your secondary device, you're going to see those particular colors appear. And whatever answer you think uh, corresponds with that, tap on that. The faster you click, the more points you get. Uh, I don't think it's really a competition, uh, you guys would agree, uh, but it's a fun learning experience nonetheless. So let's start and go through the questions. So question number one, fake news. True or false, this is a credible article. So you'll see on the screen an article that says researchers warn of new giant COVID-19 variant large enough to swallow grown man whole. Is that a true, uh, credible article or not? If 
there you go. Everybody got the right answer. So it is, of course, not a credible article. I mean, very sensationalized, if you will. So at, after every question, you'll see there's a little leaderboard. So if you do have a competitive uh, edge to things, you'll see yourself rising and falling in the leaderboards. Number two, what is the difference between HTTP and HTTPS? Is it HTTP does not have spyware? Is it HTTPS is more secure? HTTPS is more special? Or there's no difference whatsoever? Again, everybody got the right answer. HTTPS is more secure. Hypertext transfer protocol, secure. Okay, so we see some movements in the leaderboards. It's my favorite part. It's like a, like a horse race almost calling it. Number three, true or false again. Celebrities are credible sources of information. Okay, so three for three. Everybody's on the ball on this one. Beautiful. Let's see who clicked the fastest though. Drew's still in the lead. Very good. Number four, true or false again. This news source is credible. More than 80% of hospitalized COVID-19 patients had vitamin D deficiency, according to a study from CTV News. Is it a credible news source? There we go again. It is a credible news source, CTV. It's, got, uh, it's been cited. It's not a clickbait. Get straight to the point. Number five, multi-select. So you can select multiple choices. When determining if an article has authority, we should look for who wrote the article, if there's enough evidence to support it, if the author is an expert in the topic, or if the date is published. So you can pick multiple. Some of them are right. I think some of them might be wrong. So more than one answer is right for this That's one. right. Okay, so we got a decent uh, turnout over here. So the two correct answers are going to be who wrote the article and if the author is an expert in the topic. Oh, look at that. Whoever that is, shot up. Number six. If you were looking for the most up-to-date COVID-19 information, you should visit, would it be CNN, CTV News, Canada.ca slash COVID-19 or WhatsApp, Facebook, or Twitter. Where do you think you should go? And the correct answer is Canada.ca slash COVID-19 for official sources. Number seven, true or false. The World Health Organization is a reliable source for all health information. Right on, most of us got it right. They are indeed a reliable source on all health information. And finally, I think this article is real. Lab assistant who accidentally poked self while preparing syringe becomes first American to receive COVID-19 vaccine. Do you think this is real? Yes, no, or unsure? Well, of course, the correct answer is no. Quite an interesting news article if it was. All right, so there is a podium. Let's tell you who's been listening the most. So in third place, we have Rayon. Second is Drew. And third, or first, who could it be? It is A. So round of applause for A. All right. Thank you guys so much for playing that. Perfect. Thank you very much, Busha, for letting us through the uh, determining the reliability of a news source. Next, we will be like priming some information about uh, COVID-19, the vaccines especially, in order for us to be like a bit more aware about what kind of uh, treatments are available, and what they what are they composed of, and 
how they work, especially. So what do we know about COVID-19? Firstly, we know that it's an infection caused by SARS-CoV-2, the name of a coronavirus. It was first uh, recognized in December 2019, and it also has an RNA genome. This is very much opposed to our DNA genome. However, our cells can also use RNA. And we know that COVID-19 uh, COVID is from the beta family of coronaviruses. This is important because uh, this means that it, it can evolve very quickly. It can easily like um, um, gain new functions from other viruses and uh, through natural selection. And we also know that it is transmitted um, between individuals through uh, the air basically. So through coughs, sneezes, uh, even talking and breathing. Uh, Next, we will talk about what uh, we are targeting when we are making a vaccine for COVID-19. So what we're looking for when we're making a vaccine is the face of the virus. And in the case of COVID-19, well, we see the face of the virus over here is the spike protein that's around it. Um, the spike protein um, is very important because we can. it actually is made out of two parts. It is made out of the first part um, uh, of it that is responsible for the recognition of your cells. So this part of the spike protein can tell whether your cells are human or not. And the second part is very important because it changes shape to enter your cell. So this allows the virus to inject itself into your cells. And the first part of the, uh, the spike protein is able to recognize your ACE receptors. These are the receptors that are important for um, for allowing you to feel thirsty and go out and drink water as well. And these are also found in the lungs. And this is how it can get into from your lungs into your body. So however, the ACE receptor is not something we can modify in terms of figuring out any treatments or vaccines, right? So because ACE, the ACE receptor is very crucial for us to live and to feel thirst. Um, next, we were talking about what what kind of what can we do to make a vaccine? So the spike protein is something that's foreign for your body. However, we can teach our body what the spike protein looks like, and in turn, we can teach our body what the ACE, or what the COVID nineteen looks like, and then our immune system can attack the spike protein in turn, attacking COVID nineteen if it infects us later on. So one way you can do that is by creating antibodies that mark the spike protein, and in turn, they mark the COVID-19 for detection. And when, when anything foreign in your body is detected by your immune system, it gets attacked and it gets basically like deleted. So what vaccines are available in Canada right now that have been approved for use? First, we have the Pfizer Biotech vaccine. Um, this one was approved on December 9th, 2020, last year. Uh, second, we have the Moderna vaccine, which was approved uh, December 23rd, 2020, last year as well. And uh, the last one is the AstraZeneca COVID shield vaccine, which was approved October 20th, 2020. That was also last year. So um, all these vaccines, the Pfizer, Moderna, and the AstraZeneca use RNA to create uh, specifically for the spike protein of the of the virus. So we have the vaccine over here in this image. We see that it's being carried by something and it goes into a human cell. And then the uh, RNA that's inside of it is, uh, is set, let, let out into the cell and the cell then makes the spike protein for itself. So the human cell ends up making the spike protein. And this ends up like um, triggering the immune system and lets the immune system know that, hey, this is something that's foreign. We should get to learn this and then attack it if it affects in the future. So, however, when, we, when vaccines create this RNA, it's only a portion of the RNA from the coronavirus itself. The coronavirus has the entire section of our, like the entire genome with everything in it that causes like symptoms. And this portion of RNA is not actually taken from the virus. However, it's taken from, it's, it's created in yeast instead. However, the yeast naturally don't express it. It's just something that they put into the yeast and the yeast ends up producing it. And this is, this is what we use to make the spike protein in our human bodies and then teach our immune system how it works. 
So how come we're using yeast? This is because um, this is because the it is a, we are able to mass produce the vaccine by using yeast to make the spike protein RNA, and this has a very high production rate. The second reason is because it's very accurate in producing the correct protein, the correct spike protein. So what if the yeast produced like the wrong the wrong protein? Then you wouldn't be really vaccinated if you took the vaccine. So this is why it's very important that we use like yeast, something that can produce the RNA very quickly. So let's get into detail about the first type of vaccine that we discussed. This is the Pfizer vaccine. And it's somewhat important to know the name of the vaccine itself in case you are looking for articles online. So the name over here is a bit complicated and oh, it's not expected for anyone to memorize this, but just knowing it uh, or having it offhand could be helpful. And this vaccine is, uh, uses the RNA to make the spike protein. Um, for the vaccine to be delivered into your human cell, it uses uh, fats to keep it stable. And it also has um, modified RNA for more stability. And it also is kept cold, which also increases the stability of the RNA that it's made out of. So, the reason why RNA is uh, use, not used by human DNA is because RNA is very much uh, very easily degraded. And for a vaccine to be working, we need the RNA not to degrade by the time it gets to inside our cells. So all these measures are, uh, are readily available to keep it from degrading when it gets into our cells. So in this diagram right here, this is just part, one part of the RNA, one component of it. And it's chemically changed very slightly. However, this light change is part of the reason why it stays like it stays uh, stable for longer. So how do we know if the Pfizer vaccine works? So there were clinical trials made um, using the vaccine on human patients. And these trials measured the antibody response of the patients over a period of time especially like in this case, they have done two doses and they waited a period of time to measure the amount of antibodies made. And the more antibodies made, the, the more it, it correlates to the increased immune response of the patient. This means that the patient's immune response can detect uh, COVID-19 better. So that's it for the Pfizer vaccine. Next, we will talk about the Moderna vaccine. This vaccine has a different name, which would be useful for if you're looking um, to search up other articles about it. This one also uses RNA. This one's been noted to be administered to individuals 18 years or older. Um, in this case, the spike protein, uh, instead of the RNA, is made to be more stable itself. So they're just changing the structure of the spike protein to make it more stable in this case, where before the uh, RNA was changed to be more stable. And this one all uses uh, fats as well to increase the stability and get it inside our cells. And lastly, this is also kept at cold temperatures to make sure it's stable by the time it reaches your cells as well. So is the Moderna vaccine effective? P preliminary studies report like an increased immune reaction at eight weeks after two doses were taken by the patients. And these preliminary studies also use like human patients or human participants. And this the specific study that I'm referencing used 45 healthy, healthy participants. And they measured the immune response by measuring the amount of antibodies that were made. So and as we discussed earlier, the more antibodies that are made in response to the vac like uh, later on when they induced the vaccine, induced COVID in the patients, the uh, more the immune response of the patient. So this is how we know that the vaccine is working. Um, lastly, the last uh, vaccine we will talk about is the AstraZeneca COVID, vac COVID shield vaccine. This is the code name of the vaccine in case you want to look up articles. And this vaccine also uses RNA to make the spike protein. However, this one's a bit different. It doesn't use fats to deliver the RNA. Instead, it uses a Macau adenovirus instead to get to, instead of fats to get to the RNA inside the cell. This adenovirus has been um, used for other um, other purposes as well, it's like a lot of scientific purposes. And 
it is able to effectively get the, vi the, the RNA inside of our cells as it works like a regular virus. However, because this is also a macaw, a adenovirus is a type of monkey, it can't infect humans regularly in case something went wrong. But of course, this has no viral like um, harmful attributes to it. And this vaccine is also kept at a very low temperature, negative 70 degrees Celsius, in order to keep its stability. And how do we know if the AstraZeneca vaccine is effective? Well, there was multiple clinical studies. However, this one that I'm referencing here used 1,077 participants. This one also required two doses, and these doses were 20 days apart, 28 days apart. And we've seen that, the, as we measured in the other vaccines, the immune reaction was measured by the amount of antibodies produced. So we, in this case, we see a lot of antibodies produced by the vaccine after the people were injected with it. As a result, we can tell that the body has now like learned what the spike protein looks like and is able to attack it in case COVID attacks them in the future. So um, because we are inducing the immune response when we inject the vaccine, there are common side effects, especially mild ones. And in, these, these include pain, redness, swelling, itching at the side of the infection. It includes like fatigue, tiredness, headaches, muscle pain, chills, joint pain. It can also include like fevers, sometimes diarrhea, uh, nausea, vomiting, and swollen lymph glands under the under, underarm. However, these are okay because um, when your immune system reacts to a foreign particle, it it recruits a lot of like its cells to attack that particle. And this causes like inflammation and redness. And this is part of the reason why there are so much um, side effects to taking a vaccine. This just means that your, your immune system is working against the viral particle, or in this case, against the spike protein that is made. And however, there, are, there could be rare and serious side effects as well. This can be is mostly a caused by uh, allergic reactions, and there they can be including like they can include hives, swelling, trouble breathing, pale color, and serious drowsiness, convulsions, and other serious symptoms like uh, numbness. However, it's important if these if you have allergies or you're concerned about having allergies is to um, talk to your doctor, your public health unit, to make sure that before you take the vaccine that you are able to take it, then you don't have any allergies to any of the components that the vaccines are made of. And you can find these components on the uh, Canadian website for the vaccines as well. They list all the ingredients. So um, I will be taking any questions regarding the three vaccines as well as the side effects. If you do have any, you can type them in the chat if you have any questions and I'll be happily answering them for you. A moment. I can't pull up the question, uh, the chat. You can also raise your hands to ask any questions. Um, can, Charlotte, can you pull up the chat for, on your end? Got it. Okay, so we have a question from Gary. What is the rationale for using two doses rather than just one? Okay, this is because um, unlike other types of vaccines, the RNA doesn't replicate on its own. This is uh, important because we wanna make sure that the vaccine gets to a lot of your body so that immune system can, like all the, the cells in the immune system can learn what the spike protein looks like. So some other vaccines actually, actually use part, like an actual living virus that can replicate on its own and spread on its own to tell all the immune system cells that, hey, this is what the face of the virus looks like. However, it, when using an RNA virus, it can't do that because RNA on its own doesn't replicate, especially the ones we are using, the spike protein ones. So this is safer. However, it does require two doses because it, we are not like, we can't say that it infects all the cells or like it tells the entire immune system that this is dangerous, like uh, the spike protein is dangerous. Um, do you have any like any follow-up questions to that? Maybe you can, there's any confusion? Uh, 
I can't see the chat, unfortunately. Charlotte, can you help me? I'm not that? seeing anything from it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm keeping it open. Um, oh, yeah, another one. Are there any other promising vaccines that are not yet approved? Any promising vaccines? Yeah, there are. One of them is called, like, uh, it starts with an N. It's like Nora vaccine or something like that. However, all of these are under review. Um, the reason why the mRNA ones, the RNA ones were approved so quickly in like a year and a, and a bit was because they're made out of subunits. However, not all vaccines are made the same way and a lot of them are still under review. We just didn't cover them in this presentation because it probably wouldn't be applicable yet. Yeah, you can use a lot of the information though that we're giving you to, yeah. to look up and read these. Um, so a lot of their clinical studies, because um, those vaccines haven't been as reviewed further, uh, whereas mRNA has been more heavily studied, um, it, it went a lot faster. <laughs> so one of them too in the States, they had, uh, I think it was Pfizer, no, it was Moderna that had a 30,000 person third phase clinical trial, which was really big and really great. So that's the reason for fast tracking that. But um, we also have another question. Uh, so we didn't talk about the blood clots with AstraZeneca. Wouldn't people with family history of strokes be at high risk? And what happens if people who are at high risk of blood clots or allergies, or do they not take the vaccine? So for to be safe, to be on the safe side, you should always, if you have any fears about allergies, you should always speak to your doctor beforehand. However, there was there is some controversy surrounding the AstraZeneca blood clotting incident, where it's theorized that some people like had pre-existing conditions that weren't really scanned for but when they went to get the vaccine. So by the time they got it, they did do a health check and they found like, oh, they might have, uh, they might be at risk for like heart disease. However, it's still very important if you have any, um, any like any, what's it called, concerns to speak to your doctor in, before you take the vaccine, especially. <laughs> That's a great answer. Yeah. And I'm just going to add in too. With science, a lot of things we look at are causation versus correlation. We can't always tell the difference. Um, but this, based on the studies they did, they found that it wasn't caused by the vaccine. It was correlated with the vaccine. So um, it kind of seemed, yeah, like pre-existing conditions were already there that resulted in that. So it was more of what we call correlation than it directly being caused. But uh, I think today, actually, if uh, you look at reliable news sources, they're actually going to publish um, their data uh, for everybody to look at because there were concerns that they hadn't published the entirety of their data. So we're actually gonna know a lot more information going forward. So keep an eye on reliable sources for that too as well. So right now I'm on the Canadian Health, the Government of Canada website for the COVID uh, vaccines. And um, it does say that the Novavax vaccine, the Pentofram Division of Pharma Science vaccine, as well as the Hoffman La Roche a limited vaccine are under review right now. And um, I hope I answered your questions. Do you kindly let me know in the chat? Yeah, I'll keep a, I'll keep an eye out and let you know if any more pop up. Um, so let's give it a five, four, three, two, one, going once for any questions and oh, the middle character of the AstraZeneca, is it an O or a zero? I don't actually know, <laughs> like the logo or the company name. I, I don't know if there's really even a space for that one. Uh, the code, oh, oh, the vaccine name. Okay, yeah. Um, do we know? <laughs> I didn't type that one, but. Sorry, I muted. It looks like a zero. A zero, yeah. yeah. And usually if you if you Google it, it'll, it'll come up anyways. Um, pretty good about discerning that if you're looking specifically for the vaccine name. Um, so in terms of effectiveness, um, just off the top of my head, they're all very good vaccines. Um, so we're going to talk about, the, well, you did kind of talk about that. They are all very good vaccines. At this point, it's if you can get any of them, that's amazing. Um, but by the numbers, um, the Pfizer-Moderna difference is barely discernible. It's quite small. Um, I think they are concerned. Too. Exactly. Mm -hmm. They're both the mRNA ones. And I think numerically AstraZeneca um, hasn't been found to be as effective, but it's still a very good vaccine and still effective at protecting you from COVID. Uh, I think a great move actually recently was um, one of the Quebec health officials herself actually took the AstraZeneca vaccine. So it was a really good public outreach move because showing that officials too, if we had our choice, like we would still just take any vaccine. <laughs> you can get no matter what, that's, that's what's important right now is just getting everybody vaccinated and healthy. 
Um, just to get back to Deborah, um, you guys said it was a zero. I've just looked it up. It is an O. So it oh, is a, it's a font issue. Vaccine code. It is an O. Um, that is, yeah, it has to do with Perfect. the font that we've used. But there you go. Thank you for correcting me. Oh, yeah, and we have another question really quick too. Uh, shouldn't people over 65 with family history cause of strokes caused by blood clots avoid AstraZeneca? Uh, and are we told, you are told um, what vaccine you're being, you're getting that day. Um, but again, too, uh, that would really be the best case scenario there is talking to your doctor just to make sure that any, they would know your family history and your conditions and how that could affect it the best because they, they know you as your patient. Um, so talking to them, or even if you can't get a hold of them, um, a public health unit, they would be able to answer that the best of their ability. Just to add on to that, um, with what vaccine you're being told that you're being administered, they also monitor you after your vaccination um, for 20 to 25 minutes to see if you have any adverse reactions. So if you're worried about having an adverse reactions that you're not aware of, they do keep you under monitoration for in 15 to 20 minutes to keep, um, to make sure that nothing goes wrong. And they're there right there, a medical professional is there to help you out. And just really quick to correct myself. So um, it's not um, necessarily one is more effective than the other with those percentages. Um, it's more of a pass fail and all the vaccines are passed. So they are all really good vaccines. Um, and yes, we will be sending a copy of the presentation afterwards that you guys will have all this information to reference for your own. And you do, you get a receipt um, yep. saying you've been vaccinated and with the next time of your appointment. And that's a good point too. We, we didn't talk about people or children under 18. So the reason why, um, we might mention that later, but just in case, I'll just say right now, um, it all comes back to the testing. So they haven't necessarily tested the vaccine on people under 18 there. it's It's been more people. I, I think usually that's for ethical reasons <laughs> that they don't necessarily test it on kids right away. Um, they're probably going to, as they go forward with that, look into that more. Um, but right now, it's just a matter of data, too. So we're going to talk about that, too, when we get to herd immunity. I'll be uh, talking to you guys about that and why it's then important for everybody else who can right now get the vaccine. Um, I think we should uh, move on. We will have more question breaks coming up. Uh, Saima, you can go ahead. You're muted, by the way, Sam. There you go. Um, all right, so we're going to talk a little bit about vaccine de development. So this pretty picture right over here and a little timeline shows how normally a vaccine, in order for it to develop, um, it takes about 10 to 15 years. And you can see that it composed of many stages of vaccine development. And a lot of questions are asked on how did this mRNA vaccine um, come so quickly, and which Yahya covered um, as well in the previous slides, but I will go a little bit over that as well. So the, I'm just going to go through the few stages that the vaccine, in order to approve a vaccine and to be administered to the public, what stages it goes through. The first very important stage is called the exploratory and the preclinical stage. Now, this is very crucial because it, it is the, like, they have to look at the virus and study the virus to see what part of it can we actually target to in order to create an effective vaccine for you. And then what they do, the second part of that is the preclinical, which is where you um, use this and you substitute this. Uh, this in involves cell culture and tissue cultures and trials on animal models to see how it responds and if the immune, um, the if there's an immune response in, um, activated in those animals, and which takes about two to three years. Now the second phase right over here is the phase one um, in clinical trials. And this takes about, again, two to three years. And this is the phase one is also named, named as the safety stage where they administer the vaccine to humans in small number of healthy individuals to test the drug doses of immune response. So they test multiple little doses of the actual um, pre, uh, the approved preclinical um, portion in little doses increasing to see which one of those doses will cause an immune response in humans. Because obviously we're different than the animals. 
and whether it does cause an immune response in the human. And then the second phase is also named as a clinical, the so second phase of the clinical trial also takes two to three years, which it tests. It's again, an expanded study safety um, clinical trial where they give to hundreds of people and split into different groups to check how does the immune response work in different people to see if the doses that were effective in phase one, how do they affect in different types and different groups of people. Now, again, it's also a safety to see how much dose do we need to actually administer to have an immune response in humans. Then comes the third phase of the clinical trial, which again takes two to three years, and it is efficacy. So a large scale trial, a lot of people, they administer a bunch of people with different ages with the placebo. So they test with the group of the actual vaccination and then the placebo, which if you don't know, it's not a vaccine. It's a, you don't know it's a blind study they either administer the vaccine or they administer something that is not very not anything like the vaccine it's just a placebo to see if there is an effect on the to confirm the vaccine is safe and it gives a more appropriate dose for being used and over here it's how they also compare the rate and of the disease incidence reduced to the vaccinated group compared to the placebo. So they look at the people who didn't get the vaccine compared to who did get the vaccine. What is the ratio of the infection and how, did, how, does, it, um, how does it affect in humans compared to not having anything? And then once all of these clinical trials are passed, it goes through the approval committee where they, it takes about one to two years to approve the vaccine, where they look at all the numbers and see what's the appropriate thing. Once all the phases complete, they go through the approval, com like the approval committee, committee and in case of emergency use in pandemics, it is approved quickly due to the time sensitive and the rapid spread. So this is what, why the COVID vaccine was approved so quickly when it normally will take one to two years for it to get approved um, because of the pandemic. And then once it's approved, it's ready to be administered to the public. So as you can see that these are all the stages that are taken in place to make sure the vaccine is an appropriate measure uh, appropriate for our, ourselves. Next slide, please. I'm not able to control anymore. Okay, so this is a little slide again to show um, an expedited um, portion of the actual vaccine right over here. So you can obviously see it takes 12 to 24 months and it's a much faster than average development time that you saw on the previous slide from 12 to 15 years. And on this side over here, I have a table that's outlined from a study from the Moderna vaccine, and it highlights all of the stages of their clinical trials. So the first phase, second phase, and third phase. So you can see the numbers. If you have the PDF, you can zoom in and take a look. Um, once you have the PDF, you can see the first phase trials, the amount of people, the age groups that they administer to, the amount of people that they administer to, and what doses of the vaccine to see the effect on our immune response. And goes to stage two, which is a phase two, and it's all the expanded um, safety measure and also tells you the cohort, so the amount of groups where they do multiple groups and the amount of numbers in each group, along with the doses that were effective in the first dose right here. And then the third phase, which is the, the large scale study where they again show you how many people that they administered to and the dose that they administered placebo to, which is the no vaccine, and then the amount, the vaccine dose of the effective dose that they found out from the previous one. And they gave two injections 20 days apart. Just like Riahia mentioned, we need two days doses for these vaccines. Now over here, you can see that it's a much faster than average time. And as you can see in table nine, they didn't, they didn't pass or surpass any of the phases. They did the phase one, they did the phase two, and they did the phase three, which is to ensure the safety of the actual vaccine. The thing is that we had so many volunteers and because of the pandemic and the funding, they were able to get this started real quickly to make sure that we are more um, safe to go back to how we were before. And again, the approval um, committee, as I mentioned earlier, it was, um, it was approved in the emergency case because of the spread and the spread of the COVID vaccine. Okay, so how is it made very quickly? So it's, it's a reliable way, to, like Yahya mentioned, they use a the yeast and they only use a sub portion. So they're not making the entire thing. They're not using the actual virus. They're not using 
uh, the dead virus, they're making a subunit from yeast and they're administered in you. So, and as Yahya mentioned, it's a very reliable source of um, it's showing the actual spike protein, the face of the virus. And it's tested with many other viruses that are going to be listed on the next. Um, it's being tested on many other for making virus of uh, vaccinations for other viruses as well. And it to make the spike protein consistency. And there's no chance of mutation because you're only coding for one protein on top of your virus base. And, and there's no inactivation. And the thing is that the on, because of this, you have to administer multiple doses to make sure that your whole body knows that spike protein like Yahya mentioned. Next slide. So over here you can see the so these are all the like these are all the RNA vaccines that are being researched for other viruses and they're currently still in the early phase trials. So like all of these viruses you can research on them, but again they're very you might not even know some of these. Like when I looked at this, I did not know a lot of these and I had to search them up to learn more about them. Again, they're so they're localized in different countries They're localized to a specific area. So that's why um, they're gonna take their time to create a vaccine that's effective and they're gonna study slowly on these um, to make an official uh, vaccination for these viruses. But again, they are using the same spike protein mechanism like mRNA to, um, and they're currently being tested for early phase trials. So the reason why they're still in the preclinical, the early phases is because it takes a long time to develop a vaccine. Now, because of the emergency situation that we have and the spread of COVID and how it spread so quickly around the world and the amount of people that were affected by it and the, um, the numbers that were adding up, we wanted to make sure that we have something right away to get started on immunity to make sure that none of us and who are immunocompromised and people who are at, uh, who are vulnerable to make sure that they're safe. So that's why there was a lot of funding all over the place. Everybody started working on developing a safe vaccine for everyone. And as you can see, we have three vaccines that are currently working, the Pfizer, the Moderna, and the AstraZeneca. And there are multiple other that are still being studied. And they're um, like Johnson Johnson, which currently is approved in the US. And we have other vaccines like Nor Norovax that are currently being studied as well to have in the clin clinical trials. Any questions on this portion? And I just want to so make sure did, that you guys know. Yep. Oh, I was just going to let you know, we did get a question in the chat about who volunteers oh. and makes himself available. That's a really I can good help you question. Out with that one. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, sir, um, so it is a call for volunteers. I think usually they'll say, or specifically with the Corona one, they did say 18 or over. Um, and they do ask for volunteers themselves to come over. So it's not people being called on the phone, like you've been selected to be a volunteer. And there is monetary mm -hmm. compensation for them. Um, and there's also no guarantee that you're going to be put in the vaccine group. You could be, uh, so we talked about those placebo groups. You, you could actually end up getting the placebo and not end up knowing because of the study. Um, I, I'm not sure if they're double blind or just blind to the participants. So what that would mean is uh, a double blind experiment is when the person administering the shot and the patient, neither of them know what vaccine, if they're actually getting the vaccine or the placebo, which is uh, the pretend vaccine so that we, we know that there's, you know, no psychosomatic effects or any bias going into that. Um, I'm not sure if they did double blind, but they probably, they definitely did not tell the volunteers <laughs> which one they were getting. And then just to make sure that you know, it actually is the vaccine. So we talked about causation versus correlation, having placebos and what we call often control groups helps us figure that out in science. Do we have any other questions? It doesn't look like it, which means I, <laughs> I've been doing a lot of question talking, but uh, I get to talk mm -hmm. to you guys now. <laughs> okay, uh, I will just grab. Yeah, I'll control. give it to Charlotte, who is going to move on to the herd immunity. I'm going to stop the control. Here we go. Okay, there you go. Okay, good. It's working. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so we're going to talk about herd immunity. So we've talked about uh, how to discern fake from real information and 
talked a little bit about the vaccine and the virus itself, but why is it actually important? Why is getting vaccinated important? That's what we're gonna talk about here. So first slide looks kind of heavy at first glance. I've just put these up for your reference. So I am going to introduce and talk more than what's on the slide about these points. But when I'm talking about other things, uh, just so you guys can reference it easily because some of these terms and especially multiple all at once can be kind of hard to digest. So we'll start with herd immunity. What is herd immunity actually? So herd immunity is the protection that's indirectly given to people, um, especially more susceptible populations when enough of the population is immune. So immunity can occur through a couple ways, whether through being vaccinated or um, recovering from the illness itself. Um, the next one we're gonna talk about is the herd immunity threshold. So this is when enough people, whether through recovery or through being administered the vaccination, uh, have become immune that the transmission risk has been lowered enough that um, we're not as at risk for transmission. So this depends on um, the average number of infections that people can get from an infected person. Um, so for uh, the coronavirus, um, without any distancing measures, this is on average about three people, um, but with social distancing measures, um, <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I've been told I'm talking too fast, <laughs> so I'll try slowing it down. Um, with social distancing measures in place, uh, it's about two and a half people. So again, this is an average. So that's where we get that half person from. But right there, that demonstrates us the importance of following public safety measures um, like social distancing and mask wearing. And the more contagious the virus is, the bigger this average is going to be. Um, so the last, uh, the next one we're going to talk about is something called onward transmission. So this is when the virus successfully spreads from someone infected to someone susceptible. And then the last two, these can get kind of tricky. So we're going to talk about the difference between them because at first glance, it doesn't look like they're that different. But this is really important, especially when reading um, news articles or listening to the news, because um, they'll talk about these two, uh, sometimes interchangeably, but there is a bit of a difference that's important to know. So our first one is case fatality rate. So this is the number of deaths that we can directly attribute to people who have been diagnosed by the illness. So in this case, COVID-19. Whereas the infection rate is the number of deaths um, that are caused by everybody infected. So what is the difference? So case fatality rate, this actually depends on testing. Um, so for actual diagnoses, you have to be tested and test positive, right? And this is only looking at a very specific point in time. But the infection fatality rate uh, what this number does is it tells us how good we are at treating people who have had COVID-19. So that's the difference between those two there. So we have those up for the reference. Um, what the heck is this image on the right? <laughs> so what we do in science is we make theories and models of things to explain concepts that we can then use to make treatments and do all kinds of things and all kinds of inventions. So this is what we call a model. Um, so this is a very simple model of herd immunity. It's called the susceptible infectious recovered model. And what that just means is when we're looking at these little letters here and what colors they correspond to, that's gonna tell us what they mean. Um, so the susceptible, the blue people, these are people who have not been vaccinated and who have not recovered from the illness. So they don't have any kind of immunity. Um, so if they were to come in contact with someone who's infected, like the little red guy here, it can spread. So as we see here, our little friend in red has now recovered, um, but has spread. So we've had that onward transmission occur here. And then there's a whole other susceptible population. So when we say naive population here, what we mean too is that majority of the population, if not all, is still susceptible. So there hasn't been any recovery or vaccination yet. So we can see here that then it spreads very, very easily, um, which really tells us <laughs> getting to the next one, why vaccination and herd immunity is so important. So this population, 70% of the, uh, this population 70% is immune, whether through vaccination or recovery. Um, here it's just showing recovery, but in the real world, uh, we're considering vaccination as well. So here we only have, we have a lot less blue people and a lot more orange people. So when we get our red person here, yes, we can still see some transmission, but look at all the people who are protected then by these people who have gained immunity. So this blue person here is surrounded by their contacts are, are people who have recovered or received vaccinations. So then we can see that it's not as easily transmit, should transmit, <laughs> it's not as easily spread. Let's use the word spread. I think that's a better one. Um, so onwards transmission isn't as successful. Uh, and so now I've kind of said a lot of words at you, but I do have a bit of a demonstration of this. So 
Uh, where is it? I will stop my remote control and I am going to share my screen instead so we can see a little bit of a trans demonstration of transmission here. So uh, can everybody see my screen? You'll see a bunch of little red and green circles. Perfect. Okay, I'll try to ask some questions too. I won't be able to see the chat because I'm uh, sharing my screen or I can, but just not as easily. Um, but I'll be asking you guys what we call engagement questions to kind of see how you've gotten your knowledge and if we can, we can put that to the test. So I'll just explain what's going on here really quick. So here, uh, we're not dealing with deaths. So again, we're talking about simple models. So we're just looking at infection and immunity. So whether people have been vaccinated or recovered. So um, this computer model that someone very generously made uh, and shared with the world, um, it doesn't talk about immunity, but I had to do some calculations to put these little numbers in at the bottom. I don't know if you can see, um, but I took that into account. So this is what we're gonna call our naive population. So this is one that hasn't been vaccinated, but we do have a little bit of recovery. I kind of modeled this at the, I went online to very credible government sources about how many people have been found to recover. And I did that math with our population of 800 here. So I'm also gonna explain how the math went into that too, because we've been talking to you guys about the reliability of information. And well, I like to think myself a credible source. If we've, got, if we've really taught you guys anything today, you should be asking questions like, why is this? Why can we trust this? Why is this good information? So I will be explaining that as we go. <laughs> so let's start. So when I click, I infect someone. Um, so I'll start in the corner here. You can see all these lovely susceptible people here. Let's look at what happens. So the infection rate too, I have also um, taken from published scientific articles. So that is where that came from. So we can see it spreads very quickly and COVID-19 isn't even one of the most, um, we call them virulent viruses. So their ability to spread between people to people. So we see it's going pretty quickly and it's infecting a lot of the population. Yes, not absolutely everybody. And with social distancing and mask wearing, that number goes down as well. But um, we can see already that without any vaccination or immunity granted, it doesn't look as good. Um, so my first question then for everybody is, how do we think that social distancing measures and mask wearing might change this? I'll see if I can shift. Does that show me the chat? Uh, yeah, I can't see the chat. So if anybody wants to let me know. Thank you so much. Yeah. If not, that's fine. If you guys just want to think about it, there's no right or wrong answers. I'll, I'll tell you how it actually affects them, but this is just designed for you guys to test your, test your knowledge if you want to give it a shot. So uh, Shaheen's asking less points of exposure. Uh, if you, and Rodney uh, Romania is asking if you cut it in half. Cut it in half. Yeah, less points of exposure to go and cut it in half. Um, so let's see. So the way we're looking at this in our context is what it's going to actually do is lower this infection rate. So yeah, we are going to have less points of exposure because um, if we have you know more people putting putting themselves out of the community by social distancing um, and wearing their masks, so not necessarily you know facilitating that spread by being out and about and making more. Um, so we do contact tracing. So we call them contacts, places where you can pick up uh, the infection. So we're reducing the number of contacts. So yeah, that could also be called points of exposure. So yeah, that's a great one. Unfortunately, <laughs> it's not quite as good as half, but here we're, we're talking about human lives. So I like to think that, you know, it's all pretty important. So I'm actually gonna change this number here. I don't know if you saw, but the way this works out is that instead of that 3.26 we talked about uh, before, the average number of people that can become infected from someone with an infection, we've reduced this now to 2.5. So I will repopulate and we'll see now that we might actually have less people. Yeah, see, it kind of stopped that. So by people putting their, uh, putting their public health measures to use, it's effective. <laughs> this is again, a computer model. Um, so it's not perfect, but it's a really good way to show that these things work. Okay, and now looking at how vaccination will affect this. So I'm going to change these rates. So let's start with 0.7. And then we're gonna keep social distancing models in place. So as you can see, there's already a lot more green. 
How do you guys think having the more green is going to affect it? Do you think it's going to be similar to doing social distancing and wearing masks and public health measures or different? Any any thoughts? Better. Better, yeah. <laughs> For sure, so let's take a look. So that would that would be my hypothesis as well. Let's look at that already, not as many, but again, we still see these groups of red cells. So these might be people who have to go into work every day, um, might not have the chance to get vaccinated, things like that. But let's say we have this little group here and let's say they decide that they've had enough and they wanna go to a wedding. So one susceptible person, okay. They can pass it on to this person. And again, we're seeing that start to pick up these people. So even it's again, demonstrating why it's really important for us to all do our part because there are a lot of connections that we can't necessarily see. And that's why contact tracing is so important. So we can figure out where these things came from, but it is, it is really important to, again, this is showing that one or the other isn't as good. If we do both though, if we do social distance, wear our masks and get the vaccine as soon as we can, that's really important. So this is just a, a visual demonstration of that. And if we up this number to 0.9, repopulate. Sure, yeah, we might have a couple, but look, it's not infecting entire groups of people or communities like we saw with the lower number. So I'm going to stop sharing and if we can get back to the presentation. Uh, thank you guys too for, for participating and sharing your guesses, your hypotheses. So you guys have the badge of scientists now because that's what we do. We make hypotheses and we test them out and we keep testing them <laughs> until they're right or wrong. And that's how we get science. Um, I don't know who was sharing their screen before, but I can try doing mine again, but <laughs> mine isn't as good. I don't have the little pointer. Perfect, thanks. Here we go. Okay, so that was our simulator. So we've seen it with words. We've seen it visually with a simulator. So now for some, some hard numbers. <laughs> oh, okay, is it controlled? There we go. So the numbers and why it's important. So the population of Canada, according to Statistics Canada, so you'll see throughout the presentation, we've been putting where we get our information at the bottom to show you that it's reliable because we got to practice what we preach. Um, so it's about 38.1 million at the moment. And the population of Ontario is about 14.8 million. So first, we're going to go back to that herd immunity threshold we talked about. So how many people to effectively stop transmission need to be immune through either being vaccinated or recovering. So that number without vaccines and without mask wearing is 70%. 70% of people would have to be recovered then. So what that works out to is about 9.8 million people in Ontario and 26.6 million people in Canada. This is a lot of people. This is 70% of the population. However, if we get vaccinated and if we you know, wear masks and social distance, that number actually goes down um, the number of people we need to be vaccinated and immune in order to reduce transmission by 10%. So that works out to, I think, roughly 1.6 million people in Ontario less and four, or no, sorry, 3.8 million people less in Canada overall. So that's a lot of people. And that means very much more quickly, we'll be able to start doing the things that we're all missing if we keep up these public health measures and we listen to officials and things like that and get vaccinated if we can. So this is just showing how important it is to actually follow these kinds of guidelines. And again, we've, uh, we've been talking to you about reliability of information, where we're we getting our information from. So how did I come up with the data? And I'm gonna put a little joke here. I'm not immune to fact checking. <laughs> I thought it was funny. <laughs> so I'm gonna show you the math and what I actually did because it can look really intimidating. And a lot of the public health documents released will show these equations but not necessarily tell you what they mean. Some of them do when they're really good, but we're gonna go through that anyways. So first, these are the equations I was looking for. for. They look really intimidating at first, and I know I can sometimes feel a little intimidated when looking at these things, but all they're doing is, all the symbols are, are representations of things. So we're just gonna talk about what those represent and how I got to where I got. So this first one is just showing us how many people need to be immune with out any immunity or social distancing and mask wearing to reach the herd immunity threshold. That's all the HI means. And then we're gonna talk about these in the next slide too, to even further break it down to really understand. Um, next one, this is how many people need to be immune with social distancing and mask wearing. 
And then the last one is with uh, mask wearing, social distancing, and vaccination, how many people we need um, in order to reach that herd immunity threshold. So that's all these equations mean. And now we're going to talk about what the symbols in them mean so that we can understand them a little bit better as well. And as always, feel free to put any questions you have in the chat. So we're going to make these look a little less intimidating now, even more so. So with the first one, this R, this little R guy here, is the average number of infections caused by one person spreading the infection. So if that sounds familiar, it should. We did talk about that. That's that 3.26 and 2.5 I keep mentioning. So what, where we get these from are studies done by scientists, so epidemiologists usually, who are looking at all the data of people who have been infected, not infected, immune. They're, they're looking at all the data, um, in this case, globally. Some cases, they'll do it country by country. Uh, we use the global one in this case. So this is coming from reliable published studies by experts in their field. So we got that authority, et cetera, there. So you can tell that we can trust that. And the next one, this E here, all that means is how effective the vaccine is. So uh, that information is also publicly available from uh, Public Health Ontario, et cetera. They have some really nice PDFs uh, going over all the vaccine information um, and they're available online as well. And these funky little eyes here, this is just how immune the population is at, at that point in time. So if you remember, um, I started off the simulation with that 0.02. That's how many people we've had recovered at this point in time uh, from COVID-19 based on the information published by Public Health Ontario. And then lastly, our little P here is how effective our measures have been so far. So again, we're getting that from published credible studies. And so when we put all of that together, then that's where I got those numbers from to be able to share that all with you guys. So the reason why I wanted to do this is not necessarily because I'm telling you that you have to do this every single time, but I just wanted to show you where information can come from and how you get those numbers in the news and in journals and publications and all that. <laughs> so to kind of walk you through the behind the scenes. And also because I want you guys to critically think and say, why should we trust what this person is saying? I'm showing you <laughs> that it's all credible information that came from a good place. So also recognize that, you know, someday, oh, no, I have one more first, sorry. Where did the numbers come from? So reliable sources, Statistics Canada and Public Health Ontario, who have experts like epidemiologists and statisticians working for them who have trained in school for a while and become experts in their field who are getting this data for us. And then lastly, I recognize, you know, some people have had a long day. We're throwing a lot of information at you. So I've just kind of summarized all the most important stuff um, I've talked about so far. So first, vaccines and public health measures are really important for protecting everyone through herd immunity. And so both of them together also are much more effective than any alone, as we saw with the simulator. It's much better to stop that transmission when you have people social distancing, mask wearing, and being vaccinated and not just one or the other. And so talking about herd immunity, why is herd immunity important? So this is because people who can't get vaccines will then protect people who can't get them at all or yet. So um, I put some examples of this at the bottom. So these are include babies who haven't necessarily developed their immune systems yet. Um, children who vaccine hasn't necessarily been tested on yet. Um, same with pregnant women, uh, immunocompromised people, and older people whose immune systems don't work as well as they used to because age affects us all differently. Um, and our immune systems are not immune to the effects of aging. So that's why it's important because there are some populations that might not necessarily have access to vaccines. So if those who can get them and can protect them, it's that much better. And that also reduces that um, herd immunity threshold then. So it actually benefits us all. So we're all working together in this. And lastly, again, if people do their part, they social distance, they wear their masks, then the amount of people it takes to achieve that herd immunity is lower. So basically, if you do your part, you do get vaccinated if you can, wear masks, social distance, then it's going to be better for everybody collectively and ourselves. So these are we're next, uh, old questions as well first, and then we're just going to briefly go through our references. <laughs> but thank you guys so much for listening. Do we have any more questions, comments, concerns? That's a good question. If people have been exposed, there would be no reason for them to be vaccinated. Um, we haven't necessarily ruled out secondary infections, I think, yet. Um, 
and there are variants. I think they're working on how to incorporate the variants with vaccines still, but we haven't come out with anything yet. But that's one of the advantages I think of using an mRNA vaccination is that eventually that they might be able to take those into account by changing up that spike protein code because that's where it's all happening in that little bit. Um, so I think it's still, um, if you have any concerns about that though, contacting your doctor and asking for sure would be the best way to approach that. Uh, and then we have another question, uh, mostly by touch, um, aerosols. I would say there is a concern about any form of contact <laughs> of the virus. So whether that be through things like doorknobs and public spaces and touching things or aerosols generated from people talking, sneezing, coughing, et cetera. I think, no, it, it's not necessarily one is more easy to catch it over the other. I think all contacts are important because anything can happen <laughs> if you come into contact with it. Uh, but probability is lower from touch. <laughs> Yeah. But it's still important that if you are coming into contact that you are are taking or just trying to take measures in place to not come into contact at all. We just want to limit our contacts as much as possible overall. It spreads mostly through um, into your respiratory system. So mm -hmm. anything that blocks like the contact from the virus to your respiratory system, like a mask, would be way better in terms of preventing the virus infection mm -hmm. rather than yeah. like touching and even touching doorknobs and any public places, the best thing to um, always practice is hand hygiene. So wash your hands after um, uh, going outside, come inside, wash your hands with soap and water at 30 seconds. So don't rush it. So make sure you do that um, for yourself, for your safety. And that would um, mm -hmm. decrease the chances of you, any, any viral transmission via touch, if you're worried about that. And please don't touch your face <laughs> before you wash your hands as well. <laughs> that's also important. <laughs> but also, I think it's important to recognize that that's not just for COVID-19. There are other viruses in the world that don't necessarily stop just because COVID-19 is also a thing. So this is important stuff for everyday life as well to prevent spread of any sort of virus and just keep ourselves healthy in general. <laughs> Uh, another question, will some people never be vaccinated due to allergies or other risks and will governments be tracking these people? Um, I'm not sure sure if how they track them, it might just be uh, the numbers more so than individuals themselves, but absolutely. So remember we talked about um, how just in those, uh, the last slide there, I'll pull that back up, but ooh, nope, that's our references, wrong way. There we go. Uh, people who can get vaccines protect people who can't and there's some listed at the bottom. That also includes people with allergies. So there are definitely populations who might not be able to be vaccinated. So that's why herd immunity is so important so that we can protect them as well. Uh, we have another question. In the future with viral cross-contamination of people and animals on the planet, aren't we just around the corner from the next big pandemic? What are your thoughts on the one big vaccine for a more permanent protection through vaccines? That's a really good question. <laughs> um, I guess that is the reality is that we do have, you know, evolution of viruses and things like that. Um, I'm not so sure about a next big pandemic. Um, we would have epidemiological experts probably who would be the best to answer that exact question. But uh, the one big vaccine thing, the problem is we have different kinds of viruses. Uh, a lot of them look a lot different. So in our case with COVID, the big thing is um, you talked about that spike protein. That's really big, but not all viruses have that. Um, so the important thing with that is whatever vaccine we have is that whatever way the virus looks like, whatever it's made up of, is that it can recognize this. So in this case, we're doing it with the spike protein. So it would be very, very difficult um, to come up with a one big vaccine because the reality is we have different viruses. Some of them, um, you heard us talk about RNA as well. Not all of them use RNA. Some of them will use um, DNA. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them. I think there's- yeah, They also like some of the mix as yeah. well. <laughs> I'm a mix. Uh, we have a whole classification system for viruses called the Baltimore. And they'll talk about like the different uh, genomes. So the genetic code of those viruses, that's how they'll divide them up. So it would be very, very difficult to come up with a one big vaccine. It would be nice, but that's why it's important to get all your different vaccines and boosters. I know my chicken pox is coming up this year. I'm watching, I'm waiting. <laughs> It's like an arms race between us and the and the viruses, because the viruses also evolve as we evolve more and more vaccines. They can also get resistances from like, uh, like separate treatments as well. That would like make it way worse later on. The arms race is a great point. Yeah. 
we see that that's all over with animals too. <laughs> yeah. That's where there's ongoing studies on these viruses, even if they're really old and there are so many studies and they still do research on those viruses to see if there's anything new, anything that they can actually make better with the previous viruses to what they can uh, vaccinations and improve on those as well. For sure. And on a positive point too, that's an evolution of things like viruses and stuff isn't always a bad thing. Uh, I mean, we have, we have really great brains. They have all those nice little wiggles and holes. That was something that then changed over time. So I just kind of want to put a positive note in there too, because I feel like we're talking about a lot of stuff that can be kind of scary, that sometimes good things do come out of that as well. <laughs> do you have any other questions or does anybody else want to add on any answers for that one? I think we are good. No more questions. <laughs> All of them are really nice questions, by the way. Yeah, and thank you guys so much for listening to our presentation and being engaged and giving us your attention. Really excited to, to give you guys this information and hopefully give you guys the tools too to use it. And when you're watching the news or reading any articles online, anything like that, then you can think about this and kind of ask those critical thinking questions. Like, how can I trust this? Is this really good information? Yes, um, we've added like a list of our references that we used for this PowerPoint right here. And there's like a lot of them, five slides. <laughs> five slides are there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And again, we are not immune to fact checking as well. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> okay, so uh, I guess if we don't have any more questions, um, I personally want to say a huge thank you to the entire team, you guys, for putting on such an insightful, interesting uh, presentation on such a timely topic. Um, very intrigued. Um, and we had a lot of great questions uh, from our attendees as well. So thank you to everybody who registered and attended, asked awesome questions. Um, and we really look forward to kind of working with uh, UTSC <clears throat> again. Um, thank you for providing this awesome group to us. For those of you that are interested, this program is being recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel um, at a later date. So if you'd like to go back and view this topic again, please feel free to kind of reach uh, us on YouTube um, as well. So uh, thank you again to everybody that participated in this. Uh, can we get, we're being asked if we can get a hard, can we get a hard yeah. copy of this guys? <laughs> yeah, so we'll, uh, I'll get a PDF and I will mail it to all the registered uh, clients. Um, attending this program currently. If you, um, so you should be getting that very soon. Mm -hmm. All right. So thanks so much, guys. <laughs>